I first became introduced to Jeremy's work in a 2015 biennial exhibition at the Portland Museum of Art that was curated by Allison Ferris um, of about 30 artists and there were five um, Wabanaki artists in that show that were front and center and that made an impression on me in Jeremy's work pushing um, the tradition of these woven pieces that we see today have continued to evolve since 2015. Since then, um, Jeremy and I have partnered together on a juried exhibition at the Portland Museum of Art. Spent a couple of summers together in Santa Fe, dreaming up bigger ideas, including his first museum exhibition in, that will be premiering in 2024 at the Portland Museum of Art. But Jeremy, as you can tell, is very ambitious. Um, some might say self-taught, even though he has had many individuals and teachers in his life. Um, so let's kind of walk through that trajectory, Jeremy, and tell us a little bit, um, you know, how you got introduced to this practice of what we're seeing today. Well, growing up, my grandfather made baskets and, and every time I'd visit him I would smell the ash um, and I'd see finished pieces. I never actually wove with him but it was always in the peripheral. Um, when I was very young we didn't have television, we were, we were quite poor and so my toys were pencils, pens, paints, paper um, and I'd play games with my brother where I just we, we would make our own toys um, whether we whether it was a drawing of a game or using I remember we used um, tin foil once to make little creatures. Just we, we were very innovative. Um, I spent several years living like that, and um, pretty much every every toy I had was art. Uh, and then we moved to the reservation, and it, that kind of went away for a while. Um, and I didn't do much with art. I mean, I I. I toyed with it, but I didn't do as much with art until uh, I was a young adult. When I was cooking professionally for for a few years, just trying to get out of the house, trying to figure out who I was going to be, and I, I didn't like cooking, and so I told my mother that I wanted to come home and kind of just reset. And when I got home, she was relearning weaving from an elder in the community, and she said, "You know, why don't you try?" weaving. So I did. The first basket I ever made was a point basket, like the white one here. Um, and it didn't look like the white one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, I finished it, and I loved it, and, and I ended up selling it for whatever, a couple of dollars, but it was more for my time than I was making in kitchens. And so I loved what it was, and I loved the fact that I could sell it because I've always liked art and, and, and I, I did art when I was younger so immediately I said I'm going to try doing this um, and I just I haven't looked back I, I've t I mean I've skipped a lot but if we're talking about basketry I kind of that, that was the that was the impetus of it do you want me to go on or do you want to? Well, I think the other thing about, you know, your mother's influence or having her mentorship, which is kind of a common... Yeah, no, she was a very important part of the whole thing. Um, my mother used to do beadwork. Well, she still does, and she did baskets. So she's always done native arts uh, in the house. Um, and she's really, you know, even me doing art as a child, she, she encouraged that. Um, a big part of basketry is harvesting the material too and getting back to nature, whether it's the grasses or the porcupine quills or the bark. And immediately when I started weaving, I said, you know, I wanna, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it all. So I, I approached my uncle and he, um, he taught me how to harvest the materials. And that, you know, having hands-on access to the raw materials, like from the tree to the basket, uh, it's it's different than if you're buying your material. 
because you know exactly where it came from, how it came off the tree, what, what part of the tree is better for what part of the basket. Um, and, um, and I think that process that you've adopted for yourself very early on, that you were going to source the materials, you are going to go out in the forest, your Uncle Moose is training you. Again, you have another exemplary mentor on how to identify ash when they're ready to be cut, harvest them, pound them, split them, refine them. You know, we only see the final, very like meticulous, precise, innovative, finished Jeremy Frey. But there's so much of a life cycle of going from living material to another life form here that I think is so easy to overlook, but is so um, critical to the practice. Well, I can't state enough. I mean, so the process of harvesting a tree you have to find the ash stand, and ash is a very, brown ash in particular is a very hard tree to find. It doesn't like to grow anywhere, and when you do find it, it doesn't like to grow straight, and if it's growing straight, it doesn't like to grow fast enough to be thick enough growth years to be a basket. So it's finding basket quality material, if you're not trained in it, is impossible. Even if you could find ash trees every day your entire life and it not be a basket tree without having some sort of training. And then that training only gets you far enough to almost know what you're doing. So then you spend 20 more years harvesting. I, I mean, even today, I bring trees home that just don't work for baskets. And it's because they're like people, they have personalities. They, they come apart different, like you could have five trees from the exact same stand, same soil, same water, same sun, and every one of them is different. Whether it doesn't split, it doesn't gauge, it doesn't pound apart, it's brittle, it's just this battle. So like sometimes I'll get two trees out of one stand that are actually amazing and it just blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. um, that being said, you know, just because they're not perfect doesn't mean they're not usable. They're just a little harder to work with, just like people. Well, and just like people, the way you're describing sourcing the trees, their specificity, their nuances, it's very clear you've developed a relationship with this material. Um, and as we can all see in both these examples in this room and in the back, something you've said from the very beginning of your practice is that you're interested in taking an ancient art form and making it contemporary. And there are endless examples in this room. Well, you know, one of, one of my principles with what I do is I, I kind of, when I go to make a new piece, I look at the last piece I've made and I I always think, you know, what did I like about it? Or maybe not the last, but the last five pieces, whatever it is. I, you know, what did I like about it? What did I not necessarily like about it? What do I want to see in the next piece? And how can I improve upon what, what's there now? And sometimes it's the subtle, tiniest little thing. And other times it's major, you know, and you never know. And sometimes when you do it, it just completely destroys the entire medium. So you just throw that idea right out and move on to something else. But what you're seeing here is probably the culmination of 500 different attempts to make a basket over 20 years. And every single one of those attempts was a step towards what I do now. You know, even if I look five years back at, at what I was doing, they, they're, they're very similar, but I see subtle differences with things that I've just changed in the last five years. And back then when I was making them, I didn't think that I had much more improvement space, you know? And so today, I love what I'm doing again, but who knows where five years will be, you know? It's, it's a great, um, it's, just a, it's just a constant challenge. I, I don't ever rest on what I'm doing. I don't feel like, if I did that, I don't feel like I'd wanna do it anymore. 
So um, I think we've talked a little bit about how you source the material, and that's probably very abstract for people here tonight if you haven't seen the process or demonstration of it. I, mean, I can do a brief explanation. Do you want to? I should have already. <laughs> so what we do is we, we cut a tree down and we use the growth rings of the tree. So every year a tree adds a year of growth. Um, we debark the tree. When I say we, I, I'm, I'm speaking of, of He's the doing this people. all alone. <laughs> I'm, 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 yeah, it's me. So I'll debark the tree pound every square inch of it. Like I pound down, I turn it, I pound down, I turn it. And you can't miss one spot because if you do, it'll stick. Can you say what, how you're pounding it? Can you like... I use the, the back of a large axe and I just swing hard and you beat the heck out of it. Um, it has the most meditative sound. It's like a drum it's beat or a heartbeat. It's pretty cool. And if you get good at it, I've done it so long, I, I have a very good rhythm now. Um, and it looks exhausting. On the reservation, Every time I would pound, every single time I would pound, when I was at the store the next day, the elders would come up to me and thank me for the, for the sound they heard. Because they, they reminded them of when they were children. Um, which, because, uh, you know, back home, a lot of the weavers, people just don't, people don't pound anymore. It's a hard, hard job. Um, so that was, you know, that was my first real, my very first experience of just getting a lot of respect for the work. And it wasn't even about the baskets. It was about the process and just giving them an experience that I didn't even know I was giving them. So that was kind of cool. But once you've pounded out the tree, you literally, you just grab, like it, it, it kind of flakes up. Each, each row will just come up and loosen up and you can pull them right down the grain. So the wood is never, it's not cross cut. It's not, you don't really touch it with a blade until you go to cut it, you know, after it's been pulled off the tree. So. It makes the material very strong. So as delicate as these baskets look, they're not. And they come off in strips yeah. that are a couple inches. And that's how I store them. I store them dry and then, um, and but then yeah, the process. The another process. process. This process, <laughs> after you split them, you scrape them, you gauge them, you, you, you just, Everything you see started as a tree, so any shape you see there has been either hand carved or hand split or um, hand colored. Or the grasses are braided. I mean, it's quite a process. Yes. Yeah, so the basket closest to you, for example, what we're seeing are a combination of materials and techniques. You have sweet grass. You have ash. You're using synthetic dye and you're crisscrossing the sweet grass. Right, so this basket um, is actually based on a fairly traditional weave, but I've, I've just adapted it. Um, normally that weave would be set in the basket. This is a belt that's put on the outside. Uh, and it's one of the more subtle pieces here, I would say. Um, you know, Early innovations were, were, for me, were the, were the finer weaves, like this one here in particular, or the one back there, the white one. Um, shrinking down the weave, because like I say, every piece is built on every other piece. So like originally, I was just making what my mother taught me. And I said, well, I need to change this. So I, I kind of tightened up the weaves, shrunk them down, and then I started developing form and shape, playing with colors, playing with the way colors play with each other, with the shape. I mean, it's it's... There's endless ways of... Um... And when Jeremy says fine weave, that's a common technique and practice in ash splint basketry. So this is what he's learning very early on from his mother in the traditional scope. But then he's taking that and expanding it into what we might consider today, as you call them, fancy baskets or base-inspired baskets and innovating them into you know, non-utilitarian, um, functional vessels that were once used for daily life yeah. into an art form. Well, you know, the, the major limitation, I think, um, to, to where I come from and what the baskets were then and what they could have become and what they are now, the major limitation was just not valuing what was being made, whether it's the person making it or the person buying it. There was, 
this complete disconnect from what went into those. And I don't know if that had to do with the fact that they were coming from native people or if it had to do with, I don't know. But one of my early on notions, and I had to go slowly, was to increase the quality to increase the price. And that was across the board for everyone. That wasn't work just for me. Um, because, you know, early on we were, we, were, we were building markets for these pieces. Um, and let's talk about that building of markets because Jeremy was part of an organization very early on, Maine um, Indian Basket Makers Alliance helped you kind of find your own, yeah. brought you across the United States to national native art markets that were very much like everything New York is experiencing right now. Think of Freeze, think of Nada, especially for native arts in the United States. And so the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, their goal was to position Wabanaki artists on a national platform and did that, and did that successfully, but particularly Jeremy became such a savvy businessman and creating a name and product for himself that I think maybe surpassed your own expectations oh, of what you ago. could have done at those markets. So, um, you know, some of the most renowned markets are in Santa Fe or at the Heard Museum. Um, and you were the recipient of countless Best of Show awards, Best of Basket awards. I think other basket makers might um, be a little envious or um, jealous of you at this point. Uh, but, um, and <clears throat> we often joke when we're there together that Jeremy will have something extraordinary like this alongside an maybe perceivably simple, fine basket like that, and the judges will go with that. Remember when that happened recently? It's happened a few times. So I, I, I like to design pieces. I used to go to the shows and I'd, I'd enter to win a ribbon because it gives you more exposure. Um, so I would, I would push myself further on a single piece and then I'd make filler pieces. But you could enter more than one basket. So I'd enter a piece, I mean, this is the one that's gonna win. And I'd put this little simple guy in next to it. I'm like, I'll just enter this too, because you know. And oftentimes, the more, it's a, but it's a, native, it's a native show. So oftentimes the more traditional um, people, but hey, you know, as long as you get to take the ribbon home. And um, so let's backtrack to your first time you went to Santa Fe you were not actually in the market. No, I went as a demonstrator. That was through Amoeba. So the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, she's right about trying to, originally they weren't, they weren't, their goal wasn't to take Wabanaki Arts National. Their goal was to bring it back. Yeah. Because we weren't. True. Our elders were passing away. The people who knew how to weave weren't teaching young people. Young people didn't, weren't learning. So one of the things that, and I, I joined, Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance like as soon as I started weaving. Um, and I used to go from reservation to reservation teaching as I was learning, teaching the youth, um, and just, just letting them get their hands on the material. Because it was really important to me to, to, to be proactive in, in, in keeping the culture alive. It was like a secondary job. The first one was to really explore and innovate, but the other one was to let other people experience it. And whatever they're going to do with it, they're going to do. Um, once we had developed, I don't know, what, five or six or seven decent weavers that had kind of gone out on their own and actually had a business, that's when people started traveling. And one of the first ways we did that, everyone was scared to go to the Indian market. I mean, we're from Maine. We weave up in the woods. We didn't, it's a big world, you know. Um, and especially if you grew up on the reservation, it's a huge world. So the Basket Makers Alliance sponsored a trip and they got us invited so we didn't have to enter. They got us invited to go as the Alliance and we just showed our work. We could sell, but um, I didn't know at the time you couldn't, if, as a guest, you couldn't enter in competition. But I didn't know that so I made this elaborate crazy piece 
One of my favorite baskets to date. Um, what did it look like? It was all cedar bark, braided and striped. It was, it was, it was interesting. I, I, it's hard to explain. Okay. But um, I went to enter, and they're like, yeah, you're not on the list. I said, well, no, I'm here. And the demonstrator, they said, well, as a demonstrator, you can't enter. I said, well, if I'm not good enough to win, I won't win. What does it matter? I'm here, and I, and I want to enter. So they wouldn't let me anyway. And, and explain what a demonstrator meant under this yeah, so umbrella they, they, of a market. Yeah, so you, Indian market is you have to prove you're native, and then you have to apply to get in. They jury your work. So it keeps... It keeps it makes sure that there's not fake native art there. It also makes sure that the quality is up and that you're using traditional materials or traditional, they have a, they have a guidelines that they, that they go with. So as a demonstrator, I bypassed all of that. I was, I was part of a native organization. So theoretically, not that any of us were, but theoretically we might not have, someone might not have been native or they didn't think it was fair to not be juried in and still be able to compete. I mean, there were reasons for it. But the following year, I won Best in Show, so. So the following year, you entered, you got accepted into the fair. Yeah. You entered your work into the jury mm -hmm. for the Best of Show categories. And did, is that the same year you won Best of Basket? Best of Show. Just Best of Show. Well, no, you get Best of Baskets first. You get Best of Baskets. And then you go through. So that, that, was, that was the biggest, because uh, that's a 1,000 artists. And, um, and again, it's similar to opening here. They'd never seen the work, ever. Like, it, it just didn't make any sense to them. And, and it's just that you get that lightning strike kind of thing. Like, it was hard to win again because they'd seen the work. They still loved it. I still won a lot of Best of Basket trees, but Best in Show is a hard one to win. You, you may never win it, so. And so I think when Jeremy says they don't, they haven't seen the work, these fairs are like any art fairs where every medium and every, there are all different categories, right? There's metals, there's pottery, jewelry. there's painting, there's jewelry, there's textiles. Now. Yeah, right. So there's uh, the categorization is very wide, and representation from Wabanaki Confederacy is bringing baskets to the table, and well, you're one of them at that time. Right. But so they, there had been past Macquarie and Penobscot baskets there, but they were very traditional. And traditional basketry looks a lot different than mine, even though it's mm -hmm. very, I mean, my work is grounded and based in it. All the parts are the same. They're just put together completely differently. So, so let's, let's talk about some signature Jeremy Frey elements of a basket scale. If I were to like, Sophistication. Yeah, I, I like to, I like to work in smaller, smaller pieces. Um, and if I do work, work in Those larger pieces, well, I mean the pieces are small. Okay. The pieces of the pieces. Okay. Um, and I like to bring the ribbing really close together because it 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 makes it. They work. The closer you can get the ribs, the harder the basket is, and it becomes this strong. It becomes a solid vessel rather than this moving piece of woven. It's hard to say. Like, traditionally, uh, traditionally, the ribs on a basket are far apart. It's just, it's just so easier it, to weave. When you're making the vessel, it's on a mold. Yeah. Ribs. Yes. Okay, just painting the picture. So yeah, the ribs are the upright. And the so, mold's in the middle. So yeah, so one of the things I've done is um, I really just brought everything closer together and made it all very small. I mean, if you're going to and I just love the look of it. Um, you started introducing points. Are those yours? The points are what I learned originally from my mother, but I've adapted them. I mean, it's amazing the different patterns you can get using points, depending on how you lay them out, the colors you put them with, um, how you separate them. It's, it, it's never ending. It's, it's yeah. so much fun to play with those. And, you know, there's other twists and, 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 and stitches that they've done traditionally. But I just love the points. Well, in this, these two. But you see, that's a perfect example. They're very different baskets, but they're the same techniques. Similar, same mold. Same form. Yep. Yep. A year apart. Yep. Uh, we had a conversation this morning about how you've innovated and played with the tops. Mm -hmm. Do you want to describe the differences? Yeah. So the, you know, so on a. 
Early on, my point baskets would have points on the cover. It just made sense. Um, the, the one on the right here, you can see it has a black, black and red cover, and the neck is black and red. Well, the neck is actually part of the basket. It looks like the cover comes down over it. Um, but it was just a different way of transitioning the weave. Uh, and then the other one has points on the cover, which would be more, more of my original designs. Um, and that, that neck that's on there is the same as the belt that's on here, design-wise. It's just a different approach. Um, they're, they're actually, it's, it's like weaving another basket over the basket. Um, Which you've done, actually, in the back room. Right, I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> so, the, so the thing is, with basketry, it's literally, it's, it's up, down, over, under, left to right. It's, just, it's the simplest little mathematical form. So to, to innovate, it's like, what do you do, you know? What do you do? It's slow. And I think that one of the things that I've found is you have to really slowly try things and see if they work and see how they work. And you have to have an aesthetic for design, you know. Um, one of the biggest changes to my work came when I got my own um, lathe so I could turn my own forms. That way I could choose any form I could think of make it and then weave the basket over it and then just refine that technique and I'm still refining um, working over a form I'm still refining it to you know I mean, there's always something to learn so. um, I wanted to talk about though some of the more traditional forms is this one in the center the urchin basket. Yeah. The urchin basket, which you started very early on, which in this show is primarily work from 2023, but there are interjections of earlier mm -hmm. work so we can see an evolution in urchins you've been making from almost the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And there's different styles. And we, there are examples of these different styles in this show too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, yeah, so, so the black and white basket is called an urchin basket, and um, it's actually a very old design. I used to take my work to the Main Indian Basket Makers Alliance store where they'd sell any, any, anyone's work. They'd buy it, and they'd sell it. And every time I'd go in there, they had this little glass case with these three, like, 100-year-old urchin baskets. And I'm just like, how did they make those? Because you're, when you're weaving, if you're weaving, if you have a circle and you want to weave around the circle, you can pull it tight and it'll pull in, right? That's great. So you can tighten up the basket. Well, as you get up, that's fine too. You can push it down. What happens when you start weaving in? If you pull it, it goes in, which loosens the basket. So the challenge was to weave the top of those. And for years, I didn't even dare to attempt it. Um, and you just, you have to get your muscle memory down, learn the materials, learn the thicknesses you need to use. Um, I had to make the forms, and so I did. It took a few years, but I did start making them, and, and I, I spent years refining them. Now I have like seven different forms of different sizes I make. Um, they've been, I think as far as what I do, they've been the most popular form I've ever done. I probably, as far as my baskets existing, the urchins, I probably have half of my baskets are probably urchins. There's also, our, um, would you mind sharing the maybe history of the urchins or the meaning behind the urchins from the like perspective of the Passamaquoddy people? I don't know what it means. Well, you do. I never even thought about it. You've told me. I don't know it anymore. <laughs> Why don't you enlight, remind me? <laughs> Well, Jeremy Frey told me <laughs> in conversation that uh, you have smooth urchins. Oh, you mean, oh, no, it's... And then you have ones with points. But that's that not, are, that, so, okay, so... But this, go ahead. No, so, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> Which is why you're but, supposed to talk. I, make, I do, I make... So urchins, when you find, like, I usually you don't, end up with a live urchin. You find the shell and it's hollow and it has a little opening and it's you know, a little basket shape or a pot shape. Um, but when they're alive, they have points all over them. 
And so the one back there is actually close to urchin colors and it has points all over it. This one is kind of a, it's its own variation, but um, I also make smooth ones. And a lot of times I'll color them like the colors you would find on the beach. So green and purple, just a smooth, it just looks like the shell that you'd pick up. Um, and it's just fun to explore different things, you know? And were they a food source? They were a food source. Yeah, that's where I was going. Okay. Well, a lot of our, a lot of, so a lot of our earlier designs are based around things we'd see. Like we make corn baskets. They look just like a, a piece of corn. Strawberry baskets. I know some people make pineapple baskets now. Uh, Acorns we make. Um, and the urchin. And the urchin for me, it's just, it was, it was a challenge. And that's why I made it. And then I just, I love the way certain weaves look on it. Because if you look at an urchin basket, you're looking at so many planes. Like you see the top, the side, and the bottom all at once. Which means that if you put the right weave on there, the weave perspective, you can see every perspective. Whereas a lot of these other ones, they're flat sided, so you have to walk up to it to see the change in perspective. But, but in the urchin, you get that change in perspective just looking at it. Now this one doesn't show it as well, but if you, if you go back and look at the one in the back, and just, just look at it. Every different side has a whole different look to it. So, and, and, but you can see it all just standing there. So that's one of the, the things I really like about, um, about the shape itself, but also I just loved being challenged. Well, and I think the reason I became so interested in your work is because not only um, the innovation of traditions, your commitment to material and process, um, your design sensibility, but from my perspective, you are just as much a contemporary artist as anyone else working today. And so we've had very philosophical conversations about what is contemporary art, what are these objects, how does this fit in to a contemporary practice, conversations around museums and curation and exhibitions, I am not a native curator. What does that mean when we work together? And so I become very interested in this idea of you sculpting material like anyone would sculpt material and the commitment to that for decades. And that results in these incredible advanced objects that I think defy our understanding of how one makes them. And so I remember the first time Jeremy let me handle one and I was afraid, like, cause he so you know, nonchalantly picks them up because he's so comfortable with them, right? And I, on the museum side of things, am treating them constantly with such care and um, you know thinking they are one of a kind unique beings that I was like I can't possibly touch this but Jeremy is someone who is so generous with anyone who approaches his work that he will let them and they're um, you know light and airy and um, See, now everyone's going to want to touch them. I know, but you're not going to. You're not going to. Uh, but to say, like, there is this alchemy at play here that I think, um, you know, when we were kind of planning for all the things I was going to ask you, um, word choices was something we had a conversation about and, like, how to be deliberate about how we talk about things or not talk about things. And I still think they're sculpture. So, you know, I had another thought, but I forgot what it was. And, and then Jeremy's like, but maybe they're woven objects. Maybe they're woven sculptures. Maybe they're woven sculptures. So, yeah, we, you know, so, you know, the conversations we had came from my whole, my whole journey, which was to take this ancient craft and move it 
to contemporary art without destroying the soul of what it was and what it is. And so it's taken, it's not something that I've taken lightly. It's been on my mind through most of the creation I've done because you know, I carry this history of a, of a people with every piece I make. Um, and there's a lot of responsibility there. And if you really think back to the basics of, of native basketry, it was this rough, rustic tool that was used to live with. And it was very much a craft. And, and it still is. Um, but, and, and the other thing was, I, I had an opportunity to go to a ready-made market to show my work with limited competition. So I took it. But in doing that, I put myself in a category that also limited my exposure. It was self-induced. So, you know, it was, it, so I don't know if it was good or bad. I mean, I'm here, so that's great um, because I, I didn't get stuck uh, there for too long. But, but the things I learned along the way and the confidence I built and the designing I was able to do, um, I wouldn't give it up for anything. You know? No. Nope. And what I'm talking about is the native art markets. If it... No, you're very disciplined, um, ambitious. Uh, so I think maybe one final question I have for you before turning it over is you're coming off opening this show. It's been a couple weeks now. Um, how does it feel? It's interesting, you know, it was, it was very exciting, opening night. I don't know if anyone was, was, it made it, but um, it was fun. Uh, it, was, it was like I expected it to be, but also very different. Um, and I felt like I'd entered some other world. <laughs> out of the woods. I felt like I'd come out of the woods, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and into the big city. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I'm still processing it. Um, I can't wait to, to see what comes next. I can't wait to, for the next project. I honestly just want to get weaving again. Um, this project, when I was doing it, it gave me some great ideas for some pieces that, that are going to be made. Um, I'm just I'm looking forward to the journey. Again, one piece in, in instructs the next. So this show is telling me what's next, you know? So yeah. If we, have any, if we want to do any questions. Would you like to take some? Yeah, I'll take any questions if anyone has anything. And... Yes. No, it's all, it's all additive, so I, I have to do the, I turn, yeah, I turn, um, it's basically like turning a, turning the shape of the basket and weaving over it. That's where the that's where the magic happens. <laughs> it's a, this is a traditional form we use. We call a puzzle mold, and it's collapsible. Um, so, on it, it, up to a certain size, because they get heavy because they're solid wood. So any of my really large pieces are made on what I call it's a rib form. So it's plates it's plates with 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 ribbing. So that one I have to weave the tops freehand. But everything here is done on solid forms. Yes? From the start of the process to the finish, what is like the estimated time for some of the larger? That's one of those questions that has so many answers. Um, they range from a week to six months, depending on the piece. If I'm doing porcupine quills, you can pretty much double whatever estimate. Because the porcupine, I don't know if you saw the loon in the other room, but um, the quill work takes about as long as the basket. Yes? When you're making these shapes, you talked about how the traditional shapes are from the town. Mm, some of them. Yeah. yeah. When you're picking up a new shape, what are some of your inspirations? So, you know, um, Feminine form is another one. 
just curves. And, and I also a lot of times think about, if you think about the urchin basket, the way that it can show the points at so many different angles, there are other basket shapes that can do that. exact week it completely changes the look of the basket so um, and it also depends am I going to put quill work on it if I am the basket is going to be more of a stand for the quill work and less about the basket so it might be more plain um, it might be lower so you don't have to it's not as tall it's just, it depends on so many things depends on what I had for breakfast that I'm in a bad mood <laughs> did you <laughs> to 15 years, and I've been storing material. So every time I, every time I, I harvest a tree, I save a tree. So I have material, and I'll, and I'll continue to have extra material. Um, that being said, the, the reason I brought cedar bark into my work was because of the emerald ash borer. The reason you see birch bark in my work is because of emerald ash borer. The reason I've elaborated on my quill work is getting ready. Um, I'm training myself to work with those materials, but I'm also introducing people that collect my work to a different view of my work and making sure it works. Because like I say, everything I do is a slow trial. So right now I'm doing scaffolding on the work, but eventually you can take the basket away and that scaffolding is the work. So it's not, you know, it's the aesthetic works. I've been able to work with barks and quills and other things at a level that I'm really comfortable with. Um, It's just like anything in life, you know? Your work changes, and why it changes, changes. But if it has to change to something else, it will. It's scary. Um, ash is a major part of my culture as well, if you take, even take that away from basketry. Um, our, our creation legends, come, uh, we come from the ash, so it's more than a material. But I've had a long time to kind of come to terms with its demise. So that's a great question. Yes? There's so much careful, meticulous, sophisticated thinking and planning that goes into your work. I wonder if there's ever the element of chance or perhaps creative mistakes that happen um, hmm. along the process when you are experimenting with the technique that doesn't quite work out the way you potentially or initially Usually it's color. It's usually color. And, and it doesn't usually go into that piece. It goes into the next piece. A lot of times I'll see, um, like actually this basket, um, Aura, it's the one with the blue. I had done another piece, and I loved the way that certain colors were working together, but I, ended up, I, I did a, an overweave over it that changed the look completely, but I wanted to come back to that look, and so I did this one. But then I forgot that I'd put color over it again. <laughs> but it worked so amazingly. Like the, the, um, the brown and the red worked in a, together in a way that I never could have envisioned. You, I mean, you don't even see the brown looking at it, but it's a huge part of the basket. So I, I guess you know, those are the happy accidents. And that'll, that, that notion will be repeated in future pieces in some form, whether it's purple on purple or purple on blue or, you know. Our, our, our basketry started off as a tool and it was made of thick material and it was a large weave and you could make five ten a day i mean you could make a lot more if you had a group of people and they were specifically tools um, once new england became colonized and there were homes and trade markets that's when the fancy basket which is the style of weaving i do was invented so it's actually a newer form of our basketry it's based on the old form but it was always made as a decorative item. And as part of that decoration, we would see what we saw in nature and emulate it. And it became fun. At first, we just made fine miniature versions of those big work baskets. And that was cool. You had it in the house. You know, you, you picnic basket with it. You, do, you make um, 
handkerchief baskets, knitting baskets for them to put their knit, knitting stuff in, feather baskets. Um, and then people became, well, they did what I do. They started innovating and they made contemporary baskets. And those contemporary baskets were acorns and strawberries. And, and that was contemporary then. And now there are these traditional forms and I'm doing a new version of contemporary. And so no, they never, I, fancy baskets are usable, but they weren't designed primarily for use, if that makes sense. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming in and listening. And, uh... Well, thank you.